is that we began 15 years ago in 1999. Kathy was there from the beginning. Um, Janelle and I are very new. I started nine months ago, and Janelle started in February. Um, it was a program within the Office of Health Systems Research and Innovation of Lehigh Valley, and we're funded by the Dorothy Ryder um, Pool Healthcare Trust, which has been lovely. They've been funding us for 15 years. They don't fund anybody that long, but they love what we're doing, so we've been getting funding for 15 years through them. We have affiliations and partnerships with different clinical departments within our health network. Our health network is very large. It's three hospitals and I don't know how many private, you know, how many practices throughout the Lehigh Valley, but it spreads from Allentown, Bethlehem, Easton, and all the suburbs north um, and south of us. So it's a very, very large area and what we're trying to do is connect with some of the departments within that network, especially departments that are working with patients who are very chronically ill. So we have palliative care um, patients who have two or more chronic diseases, um, our cancer support network, so those patients who are going through you know treatment, our hospice patients, our um, clinical pa patients that work with um, Janelle and they're super utilizers, so they're in the hospital at least how many times in six months? Um, two or more times. Within yeah, six times months. months. And then um, home, care. home care, which are patients who recently were in the hospital, now they've been discharged to go home, but they still need you know, help at home. So we are working with those departments within, within the network, and we're really what we're doing through this model is trying to fill those gaps of care, because I'm sure a lot of you are aware you know, there was a big gap between where the clinical side ends and then what happens at home. And if those gaps of care don't get taken care of, then you either see the patient back in the hospital or you see them having to go to a nursing home where no, they don't want to be. So this is a way to keep patients at home, improve their quality of life, and, you know, keep them healthy and happy. Our mission is using the principle of Time Banks USA. Our mission is to cultivate and sustain a supportive social network based on reciprocity and respect to improve the health and well-being of the community. We are a network of individual members. Um, we have about 700, but probably about 400 active members. Clinical partners, who you've heard I just mentioned, and um, service organizations. So I think we have about 33 organizational partners right now in the community that have come together to share skills and services in a non-monetary exchange system. As you all know, time may be. So most actions, decisions, and factors that lead to good health or poor health happen outside of our healthcare facilities. They happen in our homes neighborhoods and community. One person, in one year a person lives over a half a million minutes, most doctor visits last 15 minutes. So, hmm. You can see there's, there you, go. you really learn a lot. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, in the beginning, um, and actually just to step back just a little bit further, because it might be interesting for some of you, the, pro the, the whole process behind the neighbor to neighbor care team came out of a research study we were doing with our palli palliative based um, pro program within the health network. What we were trying to do was put time banking into the individual practices. The doctors thought it was a great idea, staff thought it was a great idea, but it wasn't such a great idea because they were coming to see the doctor because they were sick. So the last thing they wanted to do in the practice then was hear about, oh, well, we can get you to your doctor appointments or, you know, we have this great program for you. So it really, it, it was good in the fact that it didn't work because then it led us to mm -hmm. stay persistent, keep on trucking, and so we've come to the point where we're at now. So it really wasn't all that bad. And it's helped us build our clinical um, relationships a lot stronger in that time too. But the, the beginning of our time bank actually started, um, healthcare trusts usually say, oh, we've got a problem in the community, what are we gonna do? You know, how are we gonna fix this? So they, there was a, a pool of 13 nonprofits that came together, did some research. Time banking was something new, something innovative. Um, our Lehigh Valley had never heard about it. So it was a great time to introduce <coughs> a wonderful new model into healthcare. 
they felt that it was to reduce social isolation within the senior population. So we started doing the UCLA loneliness survey, you know, and realized it wasn't just seniors who were lonely. It was a whole host of other people out there in the community. So, I mean, it was great that we learned that. Um, one of the very first exchanges that happened, which just baffled my mind, was a lady needed her light bulbs changed, high up in her ceiling. Um, her doctor told her, don't get up on a ladder, don't climb on a chair, you know, you're at risk for falling, breaking a hip. So he had her to the point she wasn't going to do this. But meanwhile, all her light bulbs were going out in her home. She tried, she went through the yellow pages, she called agency on aging, doesn't change light bulbs. Um, contractors don't want to come out unless they're going to pay. You know, you're going to have to pay them to change your light bulb. She had the light bulb, she just didn't have a way to get them changed. By the time she finally reached us, um, and it, she was just being very persistent, and then um, I'm not even sure what, who it was. It might have been somebody in a medical practice said, well, why don't you try the time bank? They might be able to come out and help you. The day we actually connected with her, there was only one light left in her house. Oh, wow. And it was, you know, it's like, really? Is this, you know, how we're supposed to be? So that was kind of a, an interesting piece. Um, and the other picture up there is actually one of our members was diagnosed with ALS. She lives in the historical section of town where you cannot have a ramp on the street. You need the electric lift. Well, she doesn't have money for an electric lift. So our members were really creative and built her a portable, removable ramp. All she wanted to do was come out on her porch and just soak up some vitamin D. But that was it. So we were able to get that in place. Um, we haven't removed it yet. She is now currently in a nursing home. Um, and she's, you know, her health is really failing quickly, but she's going to be able to go to her home. You know, that's where she wants to say her, take her last breath. So um, we've kept the ramp in place just so we're able to get her back in. But those are some of the simple things. Now today, a lot more has come out of it. Um, we have found that um, we can do simple things like home visits, tra you know, transportation to and from medical appointments, run and pick up food. And I think we've heard that a couple times today, you know, go to the food bank, pick up food from the food bank, simple things like that. Um, we also do medical interpreting. In fact, Janelle is one of our trained Bridging the Gap medical interpreters. Um, so she actually got started in time banking that way and then was able to come on board as a, as a regular staff with us. Um, simple things, help around the house. They put you on oxygen. How many times are you going to run over that hose while you're vacuuming? You know, I mean, your insurance is only going to keep replacing these items so many times. Um, so those little gaps in services are the things that we felt were really important in making a difference in some of our patients' lives. These are some of our clinical part departments that Ellen had mentioned. Um, OASIS is actually our palliative model. It stands for Optimizing Advanced Complex Illness Support. We just received a national award called the Circle of Light with our partnership that we have with them. Um, so we're kind of proud about that. It was really cool. Um, they were the only pal home based palliative program to ever receive this award. And it was because of the time banking model that was intertwined with it. So that was kind of cool for us. That just happened two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're still. We'll be touching much more detail what we do with OASIS. Yeah. But. Um, and then the other departments, like she said, cancer support services. We've built quite a few really good relationships um, with some of our clinical um, departments here. We've actually followed a patient from, she came in as an OASIS patient. She then moved on to cancer support and now in um, home-based hospice. So we were able to follow her through all those phases. We were the only ones that were consistent in what was happening in her life. Um, there was, you know, because they go from one department to the next, to the next, to the next. So it was kind of an interesting process with her. Yeah, all that red tape. <laughs> yeah, just yeah, which is a shame. It all is. The specialists not and, the, and, the, and you know what's working on her now? Holistic medicine. They're, they actually do some, um, she listens to um, Celtic music. Actually, she has uh, brain cancer, so the Celtic music actually soothes 
um, and reduces some of the pain with her. So it's kind of cool. Um, Neighborhood Health Center, the Lehigh Valley, which is the project that Janelle works with as our liaison um, with the super utilizer team. And we also have, which is new to us, fairly new to us within the hospital network, our community care teams. Um, they're wraparound teams that go into the medical practices and they pull everybody together to follow the patients. I think there are 17 pra practices now that have initiated a care team coach. So we actually do that as part of their orientation process now. Um, we introduce them to what the time they can do for them. <laughs> We've been able to partner with some, some really fantastic community organizations. We just got our local blood bank on board. Um, our members can earn time for donating blood. The blood bank will now be hopefully sharing our information at their blood drives as well. So it's just a great way for us to get a lot more advertising out there. Habitat for Humanity, Ellen had a connection there. It was beautiful. We, we actually did um, uh, bring it, fix it with them. And now they've actually asked us, they said, well, how about if we do this in our restore? So it was just a fabulous partnership. The reason we wanted to get in touch with them was so we could have our members learn how to build handicap ramps. I have two ladies who do it, and they pretty much wing it right now. So, you know, if we could actually formalize the process. So our organization partners are really important to a lot of the care that we're, we're able to do out there for our, our patients and our our own members. I'm going to go over some of the expectations of the various people that sort of make up um, our time banking model. Um, the expectations of the clinical members, because we have, um, as we mentioned before, clinical partners, um, that they will become community exchange members by um, attending orientation and completing all their enrollment paperwork. Um, that they will provide services to other community exchange members to earn time credits. They can actually donate their earned hours to um, their department, which then can be donated to the patients who need the various services. Um, and also, um, we ask that they engage patients and families in conversations about community exchange so that they can, they can learn about it as well. And these are staff members of the departments that you saw, so OASIS, home care, cancer support, hospice. They all become members, they earn as much time as they can just working with other members out in the community. So it doesn't have to be medical mm -hmm. based. It can be, I'm going to go weed a garden for somebody, but I earned three hours and then they donate that back into the larger Oasis pool, yeah. which then they donate to their, to their patients. And one of the things that, especially with clinical partners, they have to be careful. If they're a social worker in a department, they can't volunteer being being a social worker for someone else, but they can do other services, like Ellen said. And we were able to bring on our hospice volunteers. Uh, in fact, their coordinator wants to have that as part of their orientation process. Hospice volunteers can earn time for volunteering for hospice now. Mm -hmm. uh, we decided, no, that's a good thing to do because hospice right doesn't hospice use patients. that many hours. Um, so you make them members. Yeah, yeah. Now our home care patients, where in fact we're kind of in the process of evaluating that now, like how many times do we want to help them before they they themselves become a member? Um, so far, it hasn't been too bad. I don't think anybody's really gone overboard with it. Um, but we're actually looking at our data, seeing okay, how many requests came in for how many services in home care, and then how many joined. Because so. home care, many of the patients either move on to Oasis or hospice, or they're healthy enough that they don't need the care anymore. And that's when we want to try to bring them yeah, into the general. And most of them want to do something. Right now, we do want to do something uh, to give back. There are not a high percentage of Oasis patients currently who have become members. They just can't do as much. Um, I'm not what even sure what that number is. Yeah, but, what constitutes enrollment in the Oasis. Right, license. but if they, if they want to join, you know, we do give them that option, and yeah. we encourage them to join, or a family member. I don't think we have any Oasis patients that are members. Like what are the, what happens? Yeah, we do. In what mm -hmm. state is an individual that makes them then eligible oh, for they Oasis have services? two or more chronic illnesses. Yeah. That and they're, and they're referred then to that particular practice. Yeah. What, 
the outpatient practice is nice because they have a, the nurse practitioner goes into the home every five weeks. So they see what's going on in the home. Sometimes our home care patients then move on to Oasis because they just aren't yeah, they getting over higher. what mm -hmm. their, their initial illness Or they become a super utilizer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the expectations of the community exchange staff are that we will provide orientation to clinical staff members. Um, we also inform clinical partners about services available and um, you know how what our capacity is for referrals. Um, receive patient referrals, and we contact the patients then to get further detail on needs, like do they need transportation to medical appointments? Do they need you know food bank pickup? Um, and then we do member to patient matchups and keep track of service requests and transactions. And then the expectations of patient or patient's family and friends. If a patient is healthy enough or medically stable enough to participate, they can become a community exchange member. They're then uh, um, expected to participate in the same way all members would. Um, even if it says something like making phone calls, um, we try to work with wherever people are um, with as far as their illness um, is concerned. Um, and also, if a patient isn't well enough to, to join or to um, exchange services, um, their family and friends can actually become community exchange members, and then um, they would earn their time and donate their time to um, so that the patient could receive the services. Um, I'm just going to talk briefly about the Lehigh Valley Super Utilizer Partnership. Um, in order to be referred to the program that, that I um, do community exchange for, um, like I said before, you have to have two or more um, hospitalization stays, not emergency department visits, but actual stays um, in the most recent six months. Um, you need to have at least two chronic conditions, six or more daily medications. And one of the most important aspects of the, of the referral qualifications is that the patient needs to be open to change. Um, they need to be ready to maybe make some lifestyle changes and make some changes in their in their social wellness as well. Mm -hmm. um, then the enrollment process is um, the patients are referred to the program by usually a hospital case manager. Um, the so, care so you don't get the HIPAA information. It's done, the hospital is right. doing that screening and referring. And right. there's a okay. data share agreements that actually one is in place and it happens to be with our hospital. Um, so they're working on the other two local hospitals as well because these patients bounce around from hospital yeah. to hospital. Yeah, um, yeah. But so far it seems to be ours. But we are the largest hospital, so that would, right. you know, stand to reason. But, but the exchange doesn't get uh, is not a, a HIPAA no. uh, when information. When it comes to the community it exchange is. members and patients, yeah, no, we any, don't. Any any member of any time bank that's receiving health care services from another member their information becomes guarded by the HIPAA privacy laws. Period. Right. right. <laughs> and right. so you can't you can't do things like mm -hmm. So you are covered. Yeah. You can't post you can't let your membership know that this member has seen that member to receive a particular service if it involves health care. Right. You know, or we, we're not work. the ones providing any of the health care. The member themselves can reveal right. anything yeah. they want. And that's usually them. what happens. The members pretty much tell you their yeah. life history. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and as far as the, the with Janelle's project, you know, if you see on the top there, there's a whole host of a clinical team that's wrapped around that patient first before she even comes in contact with them. Mm -hmm. So by the time she gets them. Well, tell you can tell them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you tell them. Um, so they on um, the care team. It's called. Um, there's a, a parish nurse or an RN. Um, there is an LPN, um, a community health worker assigned, and um, a social worker. And they they begin work with the patients to sort of get them. Um, stabilized medically, and then after that, um, we have we do have a, a community connector who um, works with the patients as far as their spiritual um, spiritual wishes in life, like if they want to be connected to a church or any kind of um, faith organizations. Um, and then I'm usually the last person that that comes in contact with the patient. Once the care team feels that the patient is medically stable enough, 
and they're ready for um, social, you know, social interactions, increased social interactions, um, getting more involved in the community, then I step in and I enroll them in uh, the time bank. And that's sort of how it, how it begins. Mm -hmm. So that brings us to um, the Neighbor to Neighbor Care Teams, and that's what we're going to talk about today. So the Neighbor to Neighbor Care Teams is kind of, like I said, a newer concept that we're really trying to do. Um, usually our patient to member transactions is just, you know, it's one member to one patient. And it might be a few times that that member will go visit that patient, or it might just be a one-time deal. You need a ride to this doctor's appointment, I did it for you, done. Or sometimes, you know, we have hospice patients who need a haircut. So we have some members who will go into their house, do a haircut, but that's it. But then we have some more complex patients who, they have a lot more complex care and a lot more needs. And it's not even really for the patient, but maybe for their caretakers. They might need the respite care. They might need, you know, I need someone to come in here and sit with my mother or sit with my brother because I just need to get out of the house and I can't leave them alone. Um, and so what do we do? And we've come up with this idea called the neighbor to neighbor care teams where, you know, that's, that's a lot of responsibility just for one member. They can't always do it. I mean, we're all busy. We all have full-time jobs or we're retired. You know, everybody has a million other things going on in their life. But if we could get a team around this one patient and a team that, you know, lives in close proximity to this one patient, then that patient and that family has that team that they can depend on. And so that's where the neighbor-to-neighbor -neighbor, um, care teams came up with. And so... Like I said, they, they live in close proximity. Um, what we did originally was we, we mapped where the patient was and then we overlaid that with where all our, um, you know, our, just our general membership was. And then we would start calling those members. That worked okay, but we decided that's not the best way to get people to um, participate. And so what we've done is we're going, we're doing an overhaul of our, our program anyhow. And so we had to do an overhaul of our enrollment form. And we was like, let's put the neighbor to neighbor care team as something that you'd want to offer. And people have been checking that box off. So what we're gonna do is start calling those people and just be like, come in for a training, um, and we will get you connected to the patients. Um, so we're talking about patients, like I said, people who, who are very chronically ill, they, you know, they can't be left alone, or they're very lonely, and they just really need some home visits. They might need home visits, they might need some housekeeping, they may need someone to go pick up their groceries for them. A whole slew of different needs that we want to spread out to different members. Um, and now they don't necessarily live geographically close. No, to but close enough. Like I think yeah. that our furthest member lives five miles away from one of our patients. Yeah. I mean, the Lehigh Valley, it is spread out area, but the majority of our members live in a centralized Allentown, um, Bethlehem area, and then in some of the outlying suburbs. Mm -hmm. How to begin? A patient is referred to community exchange via one of our clinical partners. So it might be the social worker. We usually work with social workers and registered nurses. These are the people that go into the home, do the home visits with the patient. They see the needs. They decide, um, you know, this patient probably would benefit from being part of community exchange and benefit from being part of a neighbor to neighbor care team. So I'm gonna make a referral. They fill out a very, very short referral form. They fax it or email it to me. I get that um, form added to our, our spreadsheet and then I make, I make the initial phone call. I call the patient or their family. I get in more detail what the needs are, you know, if it is transportation, when are your medical appointments, where are they, how long are they, um, do you need someone to wait for you until you're done, all that good stuff. Um, then we start putting a team together. And we have, right now, we have two care teams running, three, because Janelle has one too, but Janelle's is a little bit different in the fact that they all kind of take care of each other. Um, and those are all the super utilizers that she works with. But the one care team that I could tell you about is we have a woman who's at end-stage end MS. Her husband has been her caretaker for like the last 13 years. 
they have six kids, but all they're all adults. They're all out, you know, working and raising families. So it's just been him and her. And they're a very lovely, lovely couple. He's obviously cares about her very, very much, but unfortunately he now has to go to dialysis three times a week. So they were fortunate enough to have one of their sons move in from New York City. He now lives at lives with them, but he needs to drive his dad to dialysis and they don't want to leave the mom alone, um, you know, while he's driving her driving him and picking him up. So what we were able to do is get three of our members to go in Wednesday, um, Wednesdays and Fridays and sit with her. And all they do is sit with her, they talk to her, um, they watch movies together. One of them sings, I think they sing to her. Uh, I know one of the members does dishes because um, she thinks, you know, it's two guys, they don't, aren't keeping up with the housework as much as <laughs> she thinks they should be. But they, they just go in there and provide companionship, and it's been a really wonderful um, experience for this family. And in an informal way, the family's been giving back, too, because this family is very, very talented. Um, there's a comedian in the family. There's um, the husband's a playwright. So he's been giving acting tips and direct director tips to one of our members who's been in a couple of the local plays, and so he's been using that. So I think it's time for me to kind of reach out to him and be like, hey, you want to become a member? This would be your asset. So, but it's, it's a really wonderful way to see how we have this team of people around this family, and they've really been able to fulfill that need. And it seems like such a simple need, but if you don't have that team, then it can be very stressful. And who needs more stress when you're already going to dialysis three times a week? I mean, well, Kathy can speak more on this, um, but we don't, we, so the responsibility for our members, so we just, I mean, we have 700 members. It's general membership. They do all tons of different exchanges, but the responsibility lies upon them. They know that going into it, that we don't carry any type of volunteer insurance. If something were to happen, they are reliable. Or for that and then when it comes to the patients you know it's, you know we do protect their 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 rights but we have a very frank conversation with them that this is who's coming in they've all had background checks they've all had rep personal references um, Kathy pretty much knows every single one of our members um, through her 15 years of doing this so Kathy knows this member would be really good with this patient. And like Kathy said, she would never send anybody into somebody's house that she wouldn't send into her own mom's yeah. house. And our nurse practitioners, because we've been working with them so long, and they're also members of the Pro Time Bank program, are really clear with their patients, letting them know, these are volunteers, because we had an issue about flu shots. Well, I said, how am I supposed to keep track of 700 community people if they had a flu shot. And I said, we're not going to be able to help patients then. Is that what you want? So they went back and their medical director said, well, obviously you're not going to send somebody out to go see somebody who's already ill, who's sick. No, no you know, no. we're not going to do that. You know, common sense here. So what they said, they let the patients know. That we have no way of knowing if this person has a flu shot. And the one lady said, wasn't well, that why I get a flu shot? <laughs> you know, so it was like, so we really built, we built relationships with our clinical peeps a lot. And I think that's what helps. They're really able to explain the program to their patients, be really clear and open about it. And we do, we do background checks, we, we get two references. And quite honestly, if the family wanted to call their references, I would say, here, talk to them. You know, I don't have a problem with that. And our members know that when they give us those references, that they may get shared. <laughs> awesome. yeah. So just back to how, to how it works. Um, so I said, we, we get the, so we put the team together. Um, then the community exchange members will reach out to the patients themselves and, you know, set up their time and date when they'll go over and do the visit. And then we get the hours and we record all the hours and we make sure the hours are deducted out of the pool from the clinical department. So Oasis has their own pool of hours, home care has their own pool of hours, et cetera, et cetera. And we just make sure that we deduct those hours out of that, out of that pool. So could you say again how those pools get their hours? Um, they're donated, so 
staff members would become community exchange members. They earn hours and they would just donate all their hours back to that pool. So uh, well, RN for Oasis says, okay, I'm working. I, I earned five hours. I'm donating that back to the Oasis pool. Um, and they can keep hours, but most of them choose to donate it. We also do donation drives where, you know, we have members who have 500 hours banked. We'll be like, hey, can you donate 100 of those hours? And they're like, sure. And so they do that. Yeah. I mean, I, some of them are going well up over 2,000 hours. And I'm like, what are why are we sitting on these hours when we could be doing so much more? So we decided to start using the donated pool. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is just the model of how it looks. Um, you get the referral from the, the clinical staff. They give that to us. We then go reach out to the members and to the patient. The members then reach out to the patient, the patient's in the middle, and also at the same time, the members are getting to know each other, and so they're starting to reach out to one another as well. So it's a very nice way it works. Well, that's why I'm wondering, is there a, sort of a care team captain that that sort of knows the others. Well, um, ideally, <laughs> that's what we ideally we thought that's how it would work. Yeah. And it's so far it's me. Yeah. But we're trying. Okay. As it's things hard. get going, so with the one family that I mentioned, they, this has been going on since April. So they're to the point where I'm like, you don't need me unless something comes up. Like you guys can just figure it out all on your own, and they have. And once in a while, somebody will say, oh, I can't do it this day. Like, that's cool, just let, you know, the husband know, and he's fine with it. So they're all kind of sorting it out on themselves. Or if they need to substitute, exactly. they come to you? Yeah, um, yep, pretty much. Okay. But I, eventually what I hope is they can just say, okay, I can't do it, but can you do it? And they'll say yes. Okay. Yeah. They all have their contact information. They all have the emails. All right. I don't know if you can see that. These are screenshots. This is what our referral form looks like from our clinical department, um, our clinical staff. So they would, you know, they would fill out the patient's name, the patient's address, you know, where they live, and then they would check what department it's coming from, and then they would check out what needs. And we only, for our patients, we only provide five or six needs. So it's prescription pickup. Light housekeeping, food shopping, transportation to medical appointments, um, household jobs like smoke detectors or light bulb changes, home visits, and then once in a blue moon we do a medical interpreting. Um, like we said, we have a large cache of medical interpreters that have gone through our program. So sometimes a visiting nurse might need an interpreter to come along with her so that she can, you know, so she can communicate with the family. Currently our, our clinical staff that's home-based, none of them are Spanish-speaking, so um, they really and rely we have a very large on, Spanish. on some of our medical interpreters, which is great because it also is a way for them to do their give-back hours, because that's how we have that set up, so right. it kind of works out for everyone. Yep. So this is our um, contact information. We do have a little interaction, but if you guys want to just do questions and answers, that's one question. So is your care team employed by the hospital proper? You mean our the neighbor to neighbor care team? Yeah. No, they're all members. They're just they're part they're, of the queue. They're, they're volunteering the time, time, time bank. Bank. the time bank. Who's subsidizing the exchange? What do you mean? The time Where does the money come for for your compensation? Us? Yeah. That's through the our our grant through the Dorothy Ryder Pool Tr Healthcare Trust. Okay. Which is through the um, through our department, so they get a large grant, and then we get a piece of that. It would really help us out if you subscribe, share, and comment. Thank you.